In this segment, we'll discuss the payment system and money. The first thing to notice is that processing payments is actually very expensive. This is a difficult number to estimate, but old estimates in the US suggest that something like 3% of GDP is consumed just by processing transfers of value. For anyone who's traveled outside the US, it's obvious that US, the US lags behind many countries in the payment system, certainly the consumer facing payment system. Consumers frequently don't see costs associate, associated with payments. As a concrete example, when you use a credit card, even though you think that the amount that you're paying is directly the amount that's coming out of your account, the amount that the merchant gets is usually substantially less than the amount that you're paying. In other words, when you use a credit card, the merchant is the one who essentially gets a discounted price. This can be as large as 10% for small merchants, which is a su substantial wedge between what the consumer sees and thinks prices are and what the merchant thinks, sees and thinks prices are. In the US, there are multiple different payments systems. We call them rails. Um, and they differ in speed, whether or not payments are made essentially in real time, or whether or not they take three or four days to clear. In finality, whether or not they can be reversed. And also in liability, um, one of the things that is frequently baked into payment systems is an assignment of liability, depending on whether or not there is fraud or whether or not it was a mistake, i.e. whether or not the payment can be reversed in the case of regulatory um, by a regulator. Another way of saying that payments are expensive is that payments are profitable. This chart comes from the McKinsey Global Payments Map, and it gives you some sense of global payments revenue broken down by time and also broken down by area for the people who are processing payments. So these, uh, this, these bar charts are in trillions of US dollars. Obviously in 2020 with COVID, uh, estimates got a little bit shaky, but that is COVID. One thing to notice about this chart is the share of banking revenues that can be attributed to payments. These are extremely important for banks. They're important both for domestic payments and also for the very lucrative cross-border payments, which are, which are done through what is known as a correspondent banking system. Before we talk a little bit about um, how banks are using payments and how they're integrated into the payment system, let's take a step back and think about money, what it is and how we want to think about it as value. Money is usually described as performing three different functions or having three attributes. One, it is a stable store of value. Two, it is a unit of account. And three, a medium of exchange so easy and safe to use in transactions. To make some of these or these three characteristics concrete and explain why they are important for what we call money, just think about somebody who essentially wants to, has cheese and wants to end up with pumpkins or generally a cornucopia. If they're in a world where they can barter directly with the person who has the cornucopia, they can go ahead and do it and they can figure out what the exchange rate is between cheese and cornucopia. If, however, they're physically distant or there's some other friction that prevents them from bargaining directly, they have to go through a third party. And let's suppose that that third party owns and values cows. At this point, you have to have an exchange rate between cheese, cows, cows, cornucopia, 
And everyone has to be comfortable that those exchange rates will remain static over time. If, however, there's a numeraire good that everyone will accept as a store of value, everyone understands what the value of that store is compared to what they have and what they own, then everything becomes much more efficient. We know the dollar price of cheese, the dollar price of cows, the dollar price of cornucopia, and you can move easily between one and the other. This is why there are these, those three characteristics of money are extremely important. It's also useful to notice that money is a social institution. There's no reason why anyone would think that little bits of green paper with historical figures on them is a valuable thing. It's only a valuable thing because everyone thinks it is a valuable thing. As a concrete example, take this playing card. In the old days, the French colonies in Canada would occasionally run out of physical gold that was at that time used as money. So what did the governor do? The governor took playing cards and basically stamped them with a uh, seal. This is what the illustration is on the back. And basically said, okay, well, we don't actually have anything that we can use for money, real money, which is gold. What we're gonna use is we're gonna use playing cards. And everything was quite successful. The governor had said that this is what was going to be used as, as currency. Everyone used it and just went on with their lives. Another example are these stones from the island of Yap. Uh, basically, these are extremely large stones. They were viewed as sources of value. Of course, they're too big to move. So what do you do? Basically, they would retain an oral history of who owned what fraction of which stone. Um, here, closer to home, mackerel, apparently, uh, was used, tins of mackerel was used as currency in uh, prisons. I think partially because nobody actually wanted to eat the mackerel. It stayed around forever, and it was um, easy to use as a medium of exchange. Anything is possible to use as money. Why did we end up with little green bills as being representative of value? Well, the reason why we hold money in terms of little green bills is at some point, because if you live in the US, you know that you're going to have to pay taxes and um, it, you can do it with those little green bills. The government can also pass rules on legal tender and say what you can accept. Now let's think about um, what kind of money actually circulates in the modern economy. In the US, there are three very, very different currencies that trade at par and that we view as being interchangeable. First of all, there's physical currency. These are the green bills. Uh, physical currency is essentially an IOU from the central bank to consumers, to all of us. And we accept it because we don't think the central bank will fail. In addition, there are central bank reserves. These are an IOU from the central bank to commercial banks. This is um, a sort of wholesale money. Consumers can't actually access central bank reserves. In addition, there is effectively private money. This is commercial bank money, and it's an IOU from banks to consumers. Let's make that a little bit more precise. If you have money floating around, you probably have a bank account. So consumers who have um, cash put it in a bank. What does a bank do with it? Well, banks don't keep all of that cash in a vault. We don't have what is called narrow banking. We have fractional reserve banking. What that means is, is you put a dollar into the bank and the dollar doesn't stay in the bank. Rather, the bank takes 70 cents of it and lends it out. 
Now, what happens to that 70 cents that was lent out? The person who gets that money doesn't spend it on the day that they get it. Typically, they redeposit it into the bank. So what's happened? You deposited a dollar and suddenly there's a dollar and 70 cents floating around. You think you have a dollar. The person who got the loan has money. And essentially, the bank has created a value out of thin air by giving the person who received the loan a demand deposit. There's a name for this. We sometimes call this inside money, a, na um, a logical consequence of the fact that banks are allowed to lend out more in value than has been deposited into them. Most of the money that we see in circulation um, that I have, that you have, that everyone has, is in fact privately created by commercial banks. Now, how do banks exactly plug into the payment system? If you think about uh, two separate banks, each of whom has consumers that bank with them, at some point, the consumers at each bank are going to have uh, business relationships with each other. And they're going to either write checks or swipe credit cards or do something. And the banks are essentially going to owe each other money. So if one of the blue people over here writes a check for an orange person over here, the orange person will deposit it in their bank account and their bank is going to demand money from the blue person's bank. How does the interbank payment system work? There are various interbank wholesale platforms that only banks typically and other regulated entities like this have access to that allows them to transfer value throughout the course of the day. One of them is called Fedwire, but it's certainly not the only one. Another one is called uh, CHIPS. This is actually run by a consortium of banks. Um, if you've ever used Zelle, which is a bank, bank account to bank account, almost instantaneous value transfer system, it runs through a rail called early warning system. Accessing these rails is not free. There's a cost associated with it, and there's also a collateral cost. And the collateral cost comes about because the amount of money that sloshes through the system on a daily basis is much, much larger than the reserves that the banks have at the central bank. There is always a worry that one bank will go down and, again, be a source of systemic risk. The thought that I want to leave you with is, what does a bank do? Banks provide a bundle of services, and they do at least three things. They provide storage. So if you have money, you don't necessarily want to keep it under your mattress. You're quite happy to leave it in a bank. Once your money is there, it's very, very easy to use a bank to process payments. So they're uh, important tra to transfer value. Once they have your money, they know quite a bit about you. They know your income coming in. They know your balances and so forth. And so banks typically also offer a whole suite of financial services. Now, these three things have been bundled together partially historically. Um, storage used to be an important component of the banking system because most people used gold or metal as essentially um, a store of value and a medium of exchange. They used it as money. And because metal is easy to steal, because it's heavy, it's difficult, it was much easier to store this in a bank. Now, of course, uh, value is not stored with physical heavy metal. And so the storage component of bank becomes much less important. 
In short, there's no economic reason why these three different functions uh, that constitute what banks do should be bundled the way they are. That said, the fact that they are bundled and there is such a thing as a bank makes life much easier for regulators. One entity is easier to regulate than multiple different entities. And if there are any spillovers between the different functions, such as storage, payment processing, and so forth, then regulators can force banks to internalize those spillovers, as opposed to having to think about each individual element and how it's contributing to the system as a whole. One of the promises of DeFi is the ability to unbundle these uh, traditional financial institutions um, and hopefully to make a better system.